activity has moved you again, I see. Or did you climb all the way up here just to see the view? I know you appreciate nature and all, but this is quite a trek. I wonder how many ancient photographs and journal entries and rusty trinkets you have to abuse yourself with? How many nights of sleepless energy and nightmarish rest? How many days of pointless and undesirable pursuits? How many reminders about loving your neighbor and forgiving 77 times did you need before your withered conscience compelled you to take in the wonders of God's creation at this precise location? Many, I'm sure. You were never one for impulsive action. You needed me for that. And now I've learned to wait. You forced me to learn. But I do not wait for pity. Not for the slow, sad ascent of the hill to help out an old friend in his time of need. So old now, it's difficult to regard him as a friend. No, I wait for something else entirely. Something selfless, sacrificial, aimed towards virtue, not mere sentiment. And pity is the most putrid, lazy, simpering, revolting sentiment of all. I despise it. Pity didn't bring me here. Loyalty did. The loyalty of blood, or rather our shared bleeding. I can never see you as a friend, not really. Nothing's changed now. I know I wouldn't have clung to you as I did if we had first met under different circumstances, outside those dirty, rotting walls. Our friendship was forged by the infernal cruelty of that time. I didn't choose you. I didn't choose to love you. I had to love you. You were true brothers, stranded together by no fault of our own, two orphaned minds conjuring up secret plans and sacred bonds. And I, to this day, refuse to betray those bonds. Is that not virtue to you? Is that not laudable in the slightest? Does it lack sufficient religiosity for your taste? Don't pander to me with talk of religiosity. I strive to be as irreligious as possible. The sacred has no appeal to me if it can be held in a mortal hand or conceived in a man's heart. The sick, rambling attempts of religion to attend to the truly sacred mind of God of a convoluted pageantries and twisted enigmas. The real, tangible work of the faith has nothing to do with that. You say your bond is sacred. You say it's virtuous and praiseworthy to uphold it. I say you're coaxing the devil to the door. I have no interest in claims of brotherhood or friendship if they overpower God's claim for your discipleship. Shall I be a disciple to God or to you? As of now, you're neither. God doesn't seek your pity, and neither do I, whether it be the pity of a dead friend or a bloody brother. shouldn't torment his guest and a beneficiary shouldn't antagonize his benefactor. Somehow I managed to do both. I'm sorry. It's all right. You're not accustomed to receiving benefits and I can't criticize your hospitality seeing the extent of your accommodations. It's still sturdy at least.
Really? Again? I've asked you twice. I couldn't have forgotten again. Has your remorse escaped you so quickly? The nights are frigid here. I can hardly sleep in these temperatures. Quilts only go so far. I can't get you matches. I'm sorry, I can't do that. You know why. Listen to me. I'm not a maniac. I'm not an addict. The burning, the destruction, the frenzy of the purge didn't give me any pleasure. Far from it. I didn't want to witness it. I didn't want to be responsible for it. But it had to be. I'm cresting them only for the sake of comfort. You endured worse discomfort in your youth. I think you can handle a bit of cold. Did you really think I would fetch you matches after your solicitation last time? I know we would both like to see that old bastard dead. Vengeance might be sweet on the tongue, but I'm sure it turned a bitter bile in the stomach. Neither of us need more nightmares. Neither of us need more guilt. I've asked before Guilt? If... Whose guilt exactly? Ours? Why concern ourselves with that? Conscience would render me a coward, just as it has you, apparently, if I took to pondering after the crushing weight which I've borne. But that burden has been lifted from me. I need not worry myself with the whispering specters of past life, and I implore you to do the same. I've been liberated from them, endowed with the volition and responsibility to labor upon the transgressions of my neighbors. The log of my eye was plucked out to crucify my Lord so that I might aid in the washing of every smudge and speck that he had reveals to me. And thus, I am burdened, not with my own sins, but with the old man's. You mistake mercy for revenge. Well, I must admit, you make it very difficult to tell the difference. You possess a fantastic conception of grace. But tell me, for curiosity's sake, how are you not at fault for the loss of that poor woman who roasted alive in a blaze you intentionally started? A woman of unquestionably good character, of the kindest disposition, a blessing to everyone she knew. I doubt even your eagle's eye could spy a significant stain on Miss Beatrice. So tell me, please, vindicate yourself. Cast out the final specter. I'd be delighted to hear your reasoning. I cannot vindicate myself. That's the foul stench of religiosity creeping in on you again. If it were not for my own weakness, Miss Beatrice would be alive today. I know I'm lawfully accountable for that crime. The self-imposed isolation attests to that fact. But I cannot permit my own condemnable errors to tarnish or detract from the victory which God accomplished through me. Do you honestly justify such a distinction? How do the same flames achieve both righteousness and injustice? I realize God adores paradoxes, but you'll need to explain this one for me. Obedience is not highly favored these days. Images of Christ humbly washing feet always overshadow the image of nations falling at his feet. Obedience was taught to us with a heavy hand, wielding a blunt instrument. Self-preservation was all we understood, not service. Even so, I obeyed when the Almighty unveiled his will to me. He sent me back to the homestead for a reason. Returning there was never farther from my desires, and yet I did it. I had not a modicum of interest or investment in seeing the ruins of our terror, and yet I kept both eyes wide open. A fearful sort of love drove me there, the same love that would have led me to desperately kiss his scarred feet before he crushed my spine with his heel, as I imagined he might. It is true, my conception of grace was undeniably fantastic at that point. I knew nothing of real joy or hope. The swindling speeches of various preachers had dragged me out of the devil's damnation, leaving me in the fierce clutches of a judge who ragefully damns all imperfections. This was faith. This was divinity. A radiant tongue of fire rested upon my head, and I could feel my brain melting from its heat. So I did the only thing I could. 
and wandered into the wilderness. I kept on walking till my steps slackened at the edge of the outer fields. I stood there, gazing at the property for who knows how long. A new moon had betrayed me to the immeasurable dark, and to my horror, the tongue of flame didn't seem to provide any light. There was a ringing in my ears which overwhelmed any night sounds or rustlings of the wind. It gradually adopted the quality of the old man's voice, growling and shrieking for my attendance at the beach shed. A branch snapped close by, and I mistook it for the crack of a switch. A phantom pain caused my knees to give way, and I fell. In an instant, profound shame swept over me, and the tongue seemed to be quenched. I couldn't rise from the damp earth. The sweat of the old man's hypocrisy had so thoroughly drenched it, and our wails had so frequently saturated the bleak air, and every inch of the homestead hung with thick draperies of hellish despair. I suspect the old man's absence had allowed the atmosphere to fester even more. How could I, a first-hand victim of that utter desolation, ever hope to overcome it or remove it? I nearly forsook my duty and began to crawl away like a dog. But as I did, I momentarily glanced upwards above the tree line and noticed Orion's belt shining, brave and true. Presently, I could measure the darkness again. I recollected the scriptures, how the Lord established great orbs of fire to fill the outer void and manifest his heavenly realms to us. The Spirit was calling me through them. He had been calling for a long time, but my calluses and hunger for comfort had prevented me from clearly hearing him. I hadn't realized that I was already fed, and I would never need to starve again. The flame wasn't meant to burn me to ash, but refine me as steel. Grace was no longer a fantasy or nightmare. It was forgiveness, a new life, a new man. I had been awakened, and now I could see that he was instructing me to fill the stifling void of that miserable place. And at last, at last, I chose to obey. I incinerated the entire homestead, and the earth became pure again. But I had hesitated. My perverse notions had long delayed me. I resisted the calling. I was tempted to hopelessness and almost succumbed. That hesitation, that error, had consequences. I am to blame. God was steadfast, I wasn't. If I had embraced my purpose with greater urgency and faith, the fire would have spread and extinguished sooner, and Miss Beatrice would have been spared. If, as you say, you weren't hungry, weren't driven by gluttonous passions, what consumed the homestead? Fire? Yes, I grant you there were flames, but flames need oxygen, and sparks need a source. The radiant light of heaven may cast out every shadow, but the dread light of hell entertains them. I might not share your chief convictions, but I can detect with what dim vision I have left that I stand on a very treacherous ledge. Fuel to the fire, blood to the heart, the old man to the new man, and I'm cut somewhere between. Your sins and his have driven you both apart, physically, emotionally, and yet your respective faiths. The similarity is shocking. You might recall Religion had no appeal to the old man either. He only needed the good book, a head to read it, and an arm to wield it. Not even Jesus himself could have torn those pages from him. Written words are useless if one does not abide by them. He stole Samson's jawbone and Jeremiah's tears, not to convict himself, but to condemn us. He thirsted for the false ointment of arbitrary blessings because he refused to be made worthy of provident ones. This worthiness you speak of, how exactly do you attain it? Do you build a heavier cross? Do you throw yourself into the sea? Do you lie down on a bed of hot coals? Or do you place a resurrected crown upon a corpse's head? You are as unworthy as the old man, but you consider yourself a saint. A worthy one perished for a cause you call just, 
Can there ever be saints among us if saints are formed by trials such as this? I've visited the old man in recent days. What? Why? For absolution. You have your ways, I have mine. I've spoken with him at length. He no longer recognizes me. He hardly knows where he is or what he's done, who he is. His memories have deteriorated, rotted away like his estate. Unlike you, I still detest him with my whole heart. I have not the moral reserves to love him. I'm not charitable enough to harbor any concern. But I do understand him now. When all the lies are forgotten, only truth remains. We were never his sons, even though we looked to him as a father. For him, adoption was the slave trade, and fatherhood, a construct, a cover for despotism. God is Father, which in his mind made him our earthly God. Weakness was intolerable to him, but strength? Strength was insubordination. Affliction begets courage, he often says, and courage yields endurance. We can blame the old man for a lot of things, but we can't blame him for our own faults, our own addictions, our own guilt. Those young ones who died to the rage of his intoxication, their blood doesn't only stain his hands. We promised, as the eldest, to take care of them. But affliction hadn't begotten courage in us. Obedience, submission, deference, those were our only resources. By a certain age, we had a responsibility to rebel. And we failed. We failed miserably. And now you sit here pontificating about selflessness and sacrifice, as if you've received a miraculous second adoption and transformed into an angel. And yet all you can long for is retribution, or grace, as you call it, for the old demons. I've said before, I want the old man to burn not out of enmity, but for his own salvation. He may have the truth up here, but his heart is dead to it. If his sins are purged in this life, that he might experience the pangs of death before death and lose himself in it. And with his final breath, with the trembling hand and supplication, and God will snatch him away from the brink. I know he will. If you doubt his ability to redeem evil for good, but I certainly don't. Maybe you look back on all those years of torment and say to yourself, vanity of vanities, but I don't. Maybe you see a lost soul as a pointless endeavor, but I don't, not even his. Or maybe you've grown obsessed with bestowing meaning upon vanity. Maybe you've built an idol out of the dust. I can assure you, I will never kill the old man. I can't kill him, and you won't either. If you fail me, I'll find a way, even as a wanted man. I'm sure you could, but I won't fail you. Oh, really? How's that? When two mirrors face one another, it's rumored that they open a gateway to another realm, somehow tearing a hole in reality, allowing any number of spirits and malicious entities to come through. The morning after my arrival at the homestead, the old man ordered me to wash my face. That cracked mirror always hung above the basin, I stared at my grimy reflection, eyes upon eyes, mind into mind, face to face, feasting and multiplying, an infinite loop of expression and belief going on and on into eternity. I opened a passageway, tore a hole in reality, and you crawled out of it. To this day, that bond has remained indivisible. A brother, a friend, a guide, a guardian. But I refuse to call you master. <laughs> I already know all this. Our nature is joined. Our future is one. Why are we treading over tired territory? Loyalty to you has become compulsion. I want liberation. I want a reformation of the will, but I never seem able to find it. 
The nightmares are exhausting, and the waking hours don't bring any peace. Only another meandering day with no solutions, and I'm confounded. There is a way. I know the way, but we manage to sustain one another without ever fully entering it. The loop turns back on itself over and over and over again. The strange circular dance of false mortification into preemptive justification, into a languid sanctification, and back again. None of them real. None of them lasting. We both realize the path of Christ requires an icy humiliation, so you pine after your own little redemption projects, clutching your ugly pearls because you just can't quite reach the divine inheritance on your own terms. And you never will, because it's not the spirit of hope and love who rules over you. I know your spirit, and he is prideful, impatient, and his wisdom cannot extend beyond himself. I don't share in the virtues you subscribe to, and I am weary of your demands. A better voice calls to me, and I think I've finally stumbled upon a solution. I wasn't sure if I would do this today or next week or in a year, but I feel that waiting would be surrender. So will you do it, or shall I? You deceive me. Yes. Did you expect anything else? It's in the nature of man to lie to himself. But answer me. Will you do it, or shall I? You're mad with a devilish panic. You can't be serious. I'm quite serious. You've convinced me with your reasoning. Fire purifies, so let me burn. This is not what I meant. How can you slander me for my alleged pride, even as you squander the most precious possession God has granted you? My most precious possession is the perfect blood of Christ. That alone is worth more than life itself. You drag me down from the altar, you tear my lips from the cup. The living word is too much for you to bear, so you sermonize. Amazing grace is too high for you to climb, so you fantasize. I am willing to go to the tomb after the cross, because I know resurrection awaits, and Christ's power will raise me up, not your self-inflicted nails. If my heart be made of flesh, I confess my due fate is ash and dust. But if my heart be made of stone, well, you will refine us like silver and purify us like gold. Personally, I submit the matter to God's holy counsel. Well, you will refine us like silver and purify us like gold. Personally, I submit the matter to God's holy counsel. <laughs>